Um, and our next guest is uh, Dr. Siobhan Johnson. Uh, Siobhan is a clinical psychologist and nurse originally from Canada. She has worked in the harm reduction... Oh, just had to. I just had a feeling my microphone wasn't on. It is on. Um, sorry, it's been a while. Uh, and Siobhan is a harm uh, has worked in the harm reduction psychedelic integration space and is currently involved in two psilocybin assisted psychotherapy trials in Queensland. Moreover, she has been involved in the establishment of a Queensland based ketamine assisted therapy program. Uh, she is a member of the Australasian Research Group on Psychedelic Science and Australian Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Practitioners and is the secretary of the APS, the Australian Psychological Society. Oh, the Psychedelic Assisted Therapy Interest Group. Oh, uh, hang on. Was that a whole title, Siobhan? Are you the secretary of the Australian Psychological Society Psychedelic Assisted Therapy Interest Group or the Australian Psychological Society? Uh, the former. I am not quite that advanced to be the latter. <laughs> that's, that's a long title. Welcome, Siobhan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to be presenting on psilocybin-assisted therapy, why and what to expect. So in terms of why, so psilocybin as a medicine has been found to be physiologically very safe across a multitude of different studies. Uh, it's been found to be a catalyst for mystical type experiences. So these are things like ineffability, transcendence of space and time, uh, tend to have noetic qualities, people can have uh, emotional breakthroughs. And some research has found that they, it does uh, have anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects. Uh, and there is also some research, of course, to show uh, that psilocybin has antidepressant, anti-compulsive and anti-addictive effects. So there's that transdiagnostic potential, meaning that it might be applicable across a wide spectrum of different mental health conditions and possibly physiological health conditions as well. So why psilocybin assisted therapy? Well, it's my goal that by breaking down the three essential components, it will become really clear as to how much uh, work actually goes into these different stages and phases to try to ensure that people get the safest and most efficacious outcomes. So we start with preparation, then you have the dosing day where you're actually giving the psil psilocybin, of course, and then you have integration. So preparation, it's part of an ongoing screening process to assess psychological preparedness to undergo this work. So essentially, you know, of course, you're going to have your screening procedures. You want to make sure that uh, people coming into uh, the, the psilocybin assisted therapy is suitable to do that work. Uh, but when you're doing preparation, you're also looking to see that they are psychologically prepared. So, of course, you know, you would expect some degrees of uncertainty or anxiety, but if that's super elevated or you can just tell the person's really not going to let go of control, that might be an indication that at the very least, it might be a good idea to delay uh, enrolling them in, in the study or at least in the, uh, to participate in the dose day. Now, preparation, of course, is absolutely essential to building that rapport between the therapist and client. And you're going to be negotiating things like therapeutic touch. I mean, in psychology and probably a lot of you know, mental health professions, we're sort of trained not to touch people. But in an, when people are in an altered state of consciousness, they might actually want their hand to be held, for example. And so you can negotiate them uh, with them up front as to whether that would be something that they would consent to. And we do something called the non-romantic uh, handhold. So uh, it's an ongoing uh, process of consent. And so it's a good idea uh, to have hand signals. So if, uh, if someone's, you know, on the dose day wants their hand to be held, you sort of agree upon uh, a hand signal that would indicate that, as well as a signal that would indicate that they no longer want that. Uh, now, setting intentions is, of course, important, but it's important to remember that the medicine, so i.e. the deeper you, it will show the person what they need. So it's really important to sort of roll with it. As we'll see when I get to the dosing slide, concepts of surrender and acceptance are really, really important. Uh, and of course, you know, if you have an indigenous client, you really want to ensure cultural safety. And so ideally you would have, you know, indigenous elder or healer or uh, somebody who's quite experienced working with altered states of consciousness who's there all the way through. Okay. 
All right, so for dosing day, uh, as mentioned, so surrender and acceptance are key. There's actually been some research to show that people tend to have better outcomes when they adopt attitudes of surrender and acceptance. And it makes sense. It's just like any emotion, right? Like the more that you resist it, you avoid it, you try to push it down, it actually grows and it grows and it grows and it becomes a lot uh, more scary. And so you want to actually uh, tr train or I guess inform the person uh, right up front that the best thing to do is to move toward and surrender to whatever is coming up, even if it is quite a challenging experience. It's also a good idea to incorporate ritual. Now, you have to be careful here, of course, because you don't want to be imposing your own religious or spiritual beliefs on people. But realistically, you know, we evolved, uh, or the use of psilocybin evolved around using it in ritualistic ceremonial contexts. And so, for example, on dosing day, rather than just giving someone a pill, you might want to present it to them on, you know, a nice sort of shrine and make it a little bit of a, a ritual, uh, as long as the person's comfortable with that, of course. You also really want to set the scene. So you want to have music uh, while someone is under the influence. And it's a really good idea to incorporate music that doesn't have language that's understandable to that person, because obviously in an altered state, people are quite suggestible. And so if they're hearing uh, lyrics, that can really influence the direction with which uh, the experience takes them. Uh, it's also a good idea to think about incorporating things like essential oils, having nice smells uh, in terms of lighting. So you wouldn't want these really bright lights that I'm subjecting myself to right now. The um, more yellow uh, ambient type of lighting kind of sets sets the mood. So, you know, things like salt lamp can, can be really nice to have. And again, we evolved using these substances in nature-based settings. So it's a really good idea to incorporate nature into the room. So you want to get some plants or maybe some artwork uh, that is, uh, is representing some form of nature. Uh, there's a concept of the inner healer, right? That we all have this deeper, uh, wiser part of ourselves. And so we want to encourage people to actually keep their eyes closed and help to direct their attention inwardly. And with psilocybin, you know, we get all of these pretty incredible closed eye visualizations anyways. So it can be quite a beautiful experience to do that. Uh, now, transference and countertransference, that comes up in any sort of psychotherapy, but in the context of uh, altered states of consciousness, uh, we find that that might be even more intense. So, for example, it's not uncommon that when somebody's under the influence of a psychedelic, that they might uh, misperceive the therapist as their mother or their father. And in the uh, grief trial that I'm involved uh, with, we've discussed the possibility of the client uh, thinking that perhaps, you know, the therapist is their deceased loved one. So how do you manage that? So it's a good idea to work with your team to role play, you know, different scenarios that can come up. And then of course, you know, with counter transference, the therapist has to be very mindful not to project their own emotions onto the client in inappropriate ways. And then again, you know, if you're working with an indigenous client to ensure cultural safety, you want to have an you know, indigenous elder, healer, someone experienced with altered states of consciousness. Uh, as somebody who is not of indigenous background, I can have a lot of empathy for intergenerational trauma, but I don't have that phenomenological experience. So having somebody in the room who has that lived experience can really help to bolster that cultural safety. So integration. Uh, so as Nick had highlighted, so I, I did a bit of, you know, harm reduction integration work in the past and often uh, what I would use uh, were what I would call integration journals. So when people are under the influence of psilocybin or really in any kind of altered state, it's just like a dream. You know, you can have symbols, archetypes, certain insights that come up and like a dream, uh, it will fade pretty quickly. So it's a good idea to write these things down uh, as soon as possible. And so so what I would do in the past is sort of review what the person had written and I would, you know, derive, for example, a guided meditation if they had certain insights or, you know, symbols, imagery that came up to bring them back into that experience. I would uh, basically create, you know, guided meditation based on uh, what they had written down. Sometimes it would also be really useful to identify certain therapeutic modalities that might be uh, useful to 
help integrate what came up from them on dose day. So for example, if it's evident that, you know, parts of a person has, has surfaced, then you might use something like internal family systems therapy or schema therapy, where you do parts work. If someone, you know, had a lot of insight around acceptance, maybe you would use an acceptance commitment therapy type of approach or radical acceptance from dialectical behavior therapy. I mean, really anything, right? So it's really important to be quite flexible and creative as as therapists. And it can be really helpful then, of course, to be trained in a multitude of different modalities uh, to titrate the therapy to the client's individual needs. With integration, you can, of course, also use artwork uh, and nature, because again, you know, we evolved uh, using psilocybin in the context of taking it outdoors. And so it can kind of take people in that natural direction to want to connect with nature more deeply. Now, I've always thought of integration as a word in a form of harm reduction rather than a novel therapy. Uh, as APRA registered clinicians, and I'm sure sort of other uh, mental health professionals working in the field, we have to work within the confines of evidence-based therapy. And so when I think of integration, uh, if we take the example of, you know, whatever came up in the integration journal, we're taking that content and integrating it into normal waking consciousness using pre-existing evidence-based frameworks. I think of it as harm reduction the best way to explain this is I like to use an example. You know, if you had a client who came in with ADHD and uh, we know people with ADHD tend to have lower dopamine levels, they might find themselves more likely to self-medicate with substances like cocaine. And so not only would you be exploring the harms associated with their cocaine use, but you would also want to get an understanding of what they're actually getting from their use of cocaine. What needs are they trying to meet? Now, I'm very aware that cocaine and psychedelics are quite different, uh, but hear me out. The purpose of me saying this is that I have actually seen people abuse psychedelics. Um, the risk there is that people might be under the impression that the only way to uh, meet the needs that they've you know, identified while well in that altered state is to continue using psychedelics. And that's where things can become you know, a little bit riskier when people are sort of out you know, using it on their own. And I'm not saying that, you know, people can't have good experiences that way, but obviously, you know, the more and more that people are doing it, then, you know, the higher the, the risk potentially. And so just like the example with ADHD client, you would want to get an understanding of what the person's needs are, and then using uh, evidence-based, you know, sober means to meet those needs helps to reduce those harms. Now, virtual reality uh, has also come uh, into the field as a form of integration. There is uh, an Australian-based company called Enosis Therapeutics, and so they've created a psychotherapy tool in VR for psychedelic integration, and it records the insights from the participants as they emerge from the psychedelic experience. So they're then able to return to these insights and build on them, creating uh, the mental model within the VR scenario, which serves as an ongoing dynamic per permanent record of the evolving psych, uh, psychological state throughout therapy. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, and of course, we want to, again, be very aware of cultural safety when working with Indigenous clients. And that poses an interesting question there. I remember reading a paper a couple of years back uh, looking at the uh, incorporation of virtual reality uh, in, in, in the realm of psychedelics. And one of the points that was made was that from an indigenous perspective, you know, these have very primordial roots. And again, you know, these substances like psilocybin were used in, in very naturalistic settings. And so with virtual reality, that's, uh, so it's such a, a, a different way of doing it that, um, some indigenous people may actually uh, see that there's a lack of sacredness to it potentially and be quite offended by that. Um, but that's not to say that the two can't meet. Um, I was talking to a colleague recently, and I know that there are some people in the field who are looking to sort of incorporate the two. So it can certainly, you can still uh, incorporate cultural safety into VR. It's just perhaps, you know, a broader conversation to have. And look, from my, my perspective, integration never ends. You know, it's our life work. 
Okay, so I'm just going to briefly touch on the current trials uh, that are being uh, undertaken in Australia. So just the psilocybin trials. And from here on in, I'm just going to refer to it as PAP. So at the moment, there is a uh, PAP trial for end-of-life distress that's just wrapping up in Melbourne. Uh, Australia's largest uh, trial at the moment is a multi-site trial for treatment-resistant depression. And they have sites in Melbourne, Hobart, and we've just opened one, uh, a branch up in Brisbane. There's the PAP for methamphetamine dependence in Sydney. Uh, there's our grief trial that I had uh, briefly mentioned. So we're looking at the use of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for prolonged grief disorder. There is PAP for anorexia nervosa. You, of course, have the PAP for generalized anxiety disorder. And then you have uh, the PAP for major depressive disorder uh, happening in Perth as well. And if I've missed any, I apologize. Those are the ones I'm aware of. All right. So just to finish off, I'm just going to uh, touch a little bit on uh, the rescheduling. So as mentioned earlier, you know, the TGA has rescheduled psilocybin from a schedule nine to a schedule eight for treatment resistant depression. And so, so some of my colleagues and I uh, have, you know, some concerns, uh, for example, just around infrastructure. So I went into a bit of detail about all of the detail that goes into the preparation, dosing and integration phases of this work. And I just talked about it in a very general sense. There's just so much that goes into it. Already in clinical trials, there's a lot, but when you're dealing with altered states of consciousness, it's just these little nuances, like things that you just don't really even think about until you're in the thick of it. And so what we don't want to see happen is, is for this to roll out too broadly, such that, you know, people are just kind of taking it in any kind of clinic without any consideration of, you know, set and setting. Uh, and then of course you have cost considerations. So for safety and pragmatic reasons, uh, therapists are working in what we call a dyad. So you have the two therapists and obviously that costs money uh, and, and you have to have a psychiatrist on board as well. And for most mental health care plans, people are using better access you know, mental health care plans, and they've now eliminated the COVID plan. So that only gives people 10 sessions per year. And by the time you get through screening and preparation, I mean, that's already a big chunk of the sessions. So what we might end up seeing is that we're creating a situation where this medicine's only really becoming available to affluent populations. I'm not saying that there aren't ways around it, um, but it is a risk and then, of course, you have, you know, training and credentialing considerations. Uh, as it stands, there's no accredited training program in Australia. There uh, are some training programs and some training programs being developed, but nothing accredited as of yet. And there are certainly no credentialing uh, guidelines. So in response to that, uh, a group of us have sort of banded together to create the Australian Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Practitioners. And so I'm just going to read what I had uh, generated about this so that I get it right. So we, it was set up and developed by practitioners, including psychiatrists, medical doctors, psychologists, nurses, paramedics. We've got some psychotherapists. If I'm missing anyone, apologies. Um, social workers, of course. Uh, initially, our focus has been on safety and governance. And personally, I'm on the credentialing subcommittee in which we're formulating credentialing guidelines for professionals hoping to do work in this space. So so we're basically trying to do everything we can uh, such that, you know, the rollout of this is done as safely and uh, effectively as possible. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Siobhan. 